Hello, it's part 19 of Open Dog, the open source quadrupedal robot, and that means I've been working on it on my own for 19 weeks, including all of the design, all the R&D, various electronics and software development, and everything else. So, so far we've got basically 12 axis, three motors per leg driven by ball screws, we've got a Teensy 3.6, which is an ARM Cortex M4 running at 180 megahertz, it's 32 bit of a floating point unit, and that's the main processor for the whole dog at the moment, and that is currently running a kinematic model, which means we can get all of those translation axis in x y and z coordinates for each foot and translate those into the ball screw lengths and ultimately the motor position so that we can keep all of that in sync and we can move the dog in six axis three of translation and three of rotation. We've then gone on to do an interpolation model that means we can move the end points, so those feet, in straight lines between um, two positions over a specific amount of time. And that should make it more stable and more predictable so that we can make it walk and ultimately balance. But we do have some more groundwork to do, unfortunately, before we can get it to take steps. So our TNC 3.6 that lives just in here is a pretty quick processor. And I've tried to run the cycle on that, so the main loop goes around 100 times a second. So each one takes 10 milliseconds. And I thought I was achieving it because the dog seems to run really reliably. When we had some issues writing to the LCD every cycle, we could see that actually slowed down the loop and it slowed the whole dog's motions down. So I thought I was achieving about 10 milliseconds for each loop. Um, we do have some more hardware to add in and I want to do that in this episode, but actually already measuring the loop, I found that sometimes it's much longer, up to 30 or 40 milliseconds, and that's mainly due to having to write to six O drives over serial, so we need to resolve that as well. But before we see what that's like, it's time for an ad from the sponsor for this video, which is Diagostini's Build Your Own X-Wing series. I've got the first 35 parts and let's see how they go together. Build the legendary X-Wing Starfighter in massive 118 scale. Inspired by the movie props from A New Hope and The Empire Strikes Back, this iconic spacecraft, instrumental in the destruction of the evil Empire's planet-destroying Death Star, has now been recreated in stunning detail. All elements are accurately reproduced from blueprints provided by Lucasfilm Limited. From the remote activated working lights, motorized S-foils, removable hyperdrive, opening cockpit to a highly detailed R2-D2 miniature, all details are captured in metal and high quality ABS plastic. This is a fabulous model for any Star Wars fan and comes with an assembly guide and magazine full of fascinating facts. Use promo code PROMOBRUTON to get a Star Wars poster and a Boba Fett figurine if you subscribe before the 4th of September. And here are the first 35 parts all together, along with the blueprints that ship with part one. So it's quite a good quality kit. There's lots of uh, details which actually get covered up and you could take that to pieces later and look at all the engine detail inside. And the fuselage here is um, actually entirely metal. This is all of the metal parts and there's lots of metal parts in the wings. So those should stay nice and rigid, which is quite important with a model of this size. So you don't get droopy wings. And don't forget if you subscribe before the 4th of September using code PROMOBRUTON, check out the link in the description, you can get a Star Wars poster and a Boba Fett figurine. Right, the extra hardware I need to fit is the inertial measurement unit, which is going to take some time to read in the loop, so it seemed pretty sensible to put that in. So it sat in here, it's really hard to see, but it's basically there where the end of my pen is, sat sort of parallel, sticking out. So the other little board you can see in the foreground is the remote receiving chip. So I've now got the IMU fitted, and that's on the I2C bus, and it's sharing that bus with the LCD, but it seems to work all right. And as you might expect, that inertial measurement unit is the MPU6050, which I use in a lot of projects, and I'm using Jeff Roberg's I2C devlib to go and read that data. So if we go into the Arduino folder and go into MPU6050, we'll find um, the library here along with some examples. Now this chip has DMP on, which is the digital motion processor, which on the chip, will actually combine the gyro and the accelerometer data to give you the actual envelope of motion, and it's pretty accurate. But in order to make it accurate, you have to run the IMU0 example, which will give you some offsets you put into your sketch. So first of all, I spirit leveled the dog, and we ran that sketch and got the offsets from that, and then we get those offsets from the output of that sketch in the serial terminal, and we go and put those into our own sketch. And those offsets look like this, which are in the setup part of my sketch, and we've got one offset for each of the X, Y, Z, gyro and accelerometer. And of course, I've included the other stuff from the example code there to read the MPU 6050, as well as including the library itself, 
and other bits and pieces that you'll need. So when using the MPU6050 in DMP mode, it has an interrupt pin which goes high whenever there's data in the buffer. So the MPU6050 does the calculation on board, combining the gyro and accelerometer for each of the three axes, puts the data in the buffer, sends the pin high, and then the example code basically reads that interrupt and then it causes your sketch, your main sketch running on your main controller to go and get that data. And of course you have to get the data, otherwise the buffer on the MPU6050 overflows and that's not a very good thing. So you need to have an Arduino reading that data fast enough that the buffer doesn't overflow. So your loop has to essentially go faster ideally than the MPU6050 is putting the data in the buffer. So normally what I do with these projects to mitigate that, as well as obviously interrupts on Arduinos being used for other things like the servo library and the NeoPixel library, and things that will go wrong if you have interrupts being triggered, is to actually have a Pro Mini or another little Arduino partner with the inertial measurement unit dealing with that interrupt handling, reading the data in the buffer, and then sending that data over serial, and that being read on the main Arduino, which would normally be something lower powered like an Arduino Mega, and then that serial handling is dealt with in such a way that the buffer doesn't overflow on the serial buffer, and that means I isolate that interrupt from my main code. However, in this example, I've got a much faster processor. We've got the Team C3.6, 180 megahertz instead of 16 megahertz. So that should be fast enough to read the interrupt and read that data when the interrupt is triggered and read our data reliably. And we should be able to do 100 hertz, right? So we've got an interrupt attached to pin two there, which is the pin from the inertial measurement unit's interrupt pin. And when that gets triggered, so when it's rising, so when it goes from low to high, it triggers a function called DMP data ready. And that's the interrupt service routine, but we want to make that as short as possible. So that lives on another tab here, and all it does is sets a flag to one. And that's basically all it does. And that means in my main loop, I know there's data ready. To lower down my main loop, when that flag gets set to one, it basically does another function that reads the angles. And that goes back to this tab, and that is all of the stuff out of the example MPU6050 sketch that basically go and reads those angles and it puts them into an array. And the reason I've done it that way, we could of course put all of that reading into the interrupt service routine, but that means it'll be triggered at random times in the loop whenever the IMU is ready. Doing it this way means it's only ever triggered at this point in the loop, so I can define where it is in the loop and it doesn't interrupt at random times. At that point we have the data here, so the uh, your pitch and roll array is populated with the data, do a little calculation to get degrees, and that basically means we can type that out to the serial terminal. Now I'm also measuring the length of time it takes to run the loop. So here we're actually running the loop on a timer, so it's running every 10 milliseconds, so it should run at 100 hertz. But I've got a little thing here which basically resets a clock and times it the next time the loop comes round to see how long it is. So now if we open a serial monitor, uh, we can see a bunch of stuff. So on the right hand side here is still all our uh, control stick data. So if I wiggle those sticks we can see the data changing and all these zeros are the buttons. So if I press the select button we can see this one going to 1. And we can see the mode here when I scroll up and down. So this is the time the loop is taking. These are my inertial measurement unit variables here which tell us um, the pitch and roll of the robot. So everything looks pretty good. We're running at 10 milliseconds and the loop is taking 10 milliseconds. And now let's go into mode 2, which is going to actually try and write to all of those 12 O drive axes. So there's mode 1, and there's mode 2, and straight away we see this time increasing to nearly 40 milliseconds. And we see these weird waves going through, so if I just pause the data there, we can see we've got the FIFO overflow message, which is what happens when you don't read that inertial measurement unit quick enough. And we're currently triggering the inertial measurement unit at 50 hertz, and we've got... Um, a hacky bit of the code here. This is part of the library and you can actually select how fast it runs by selecting um, or rather editing this piece here. So we can um, set that FIFO rate at the moment it's set to 3 and the equation is 200 divided by 1 plus the value. So 200 divided by 4 will give us 50 hertz. So obviously our loop is not actually running anymore at 10 it's running at near a 40 and that's why the FIFO is overflowing. So I thought it was worth seeing how long the loop does actually take. Previously we had 10 milliseconds specified so everything's inside this timer function and it doesn't run unless 10 milliseconds has elapsed. So now I've set that down to zero to see what the actual time is and we've still got our counter. So in a serial terminal we can see the time here. Sometimes it says zero and sometimes it says one and that's milliseconds. Um, I'd probably get an answer around a thousand or so on if we did microseconds. I've only timing to the nearest millisecond, but that's pretty low. And that's reading all the remote data over the NRF24 LO1s, and it's reading the inertial measurement unit in that time, and it takes hardly any time. 
And again though, if we go to mode 2, of course that time increases uh, back up to 40 and our FIFO overflows because that's trying to write at every 20 milliseconds. So we do really need to do something to reduce that loop length or reduce the time it takes to write to the O drives. But that's fine though, because the O drive is open source and that means we can put custom firmware on. We can increase that board rate from the default of 115 kiloboard all the way up to a megabit if we want to. The process is a bit involved. You need to install various compilers, including an STM compiler, which is the ARM Cortex chip that's on that board. And then you need to basically compile the firmware having edited it and then flash it onto the board. And the instructions are on the O drive website. So all the things you need to install and what you need to do. I'm not gonna go into too many details here because it's quite an involved process of installing stuff. And it's not much interest unless you actually want to do it. So I thought before I go and write the firmware to six O drives, I'd build a test rig. And I might be using this whole setup for another project as well. So that's helped me out quite a bit with that. So we've got another O drive 3.5. We've got the Teensy 3.6. We've got the inertial measurement unit. We've also got a dummy remote, which is this Arduino Mega, which is got the other end of the NRF24 L01 link on it. So uh, we can see in the serial terminal there that we've got our time, our loop at the moment is running down to one millisecond and that's doing everything. So we've already flashed this to half a megabit, so five times faster, so that's definitely made a difference. And I'm writing to two O drive axis, despite only having one motor connected. So to basically write to uh, six O drives will hopefully take six milliseconds and that's well within our 10 millisecond loop. So if I now go and uh, play around with that inertial measurement unit, you'll see I've actually um, scaled that. That's what the column is on the right hand side. The ones in the middle of the data, if I mess around with the analog pins, you can see those changing. And if I go and tilt the inertial measurement unit, I've just scaled it up, which is what the right hand column is there to the motor speed, just to check that that's running okay. And obviously we are definitely writing to the O drive and that's still only taking the maximum of one millisecond or at least under two milliseconds. So that seems to make quite a lot of sense. And now I can go ahead and flash all the O drives on the dog. So I have only gone to half a megabit at the moment. This is the usart.c file, which is the UART communication, the source for the actual O drive firmware. So I've got my board rate there set to half a megabit. It says here that it will actually go to 921600 for faster transfers. Obviously you need a fast Arduino or a Teensy to keep up with that board rate. So I could go faster. The only thing to note is that the Teensy has an error at that board rate of uh, minus 0.1%, which I've actually tried this board rate and I found the communication wasn't reliable. I haven't tried a clear megabit, but the uh, wires I've got aren't screened for the serial comms and they're not even twisted in the dog. So I'm pretty sure half a megabit will do us, but we could still increase further if we find our loop still takes too long. So I flashed every O drive firmware to half a megabit and changed the code on the Arduino. I've also gone through all 12 axis. Obviously the firmware upgrade wiped out all the settings. So I've had to set the brake resistance to zero because there isn't one because I'm using batteries and regenerative braking. Set the encoder offset and the motor calibration on every one of the 12 axis. And now um, everything works. So it seems to communicate fine at half a megabit. And it does that um, over bits of wire that aren't even screened or twisted. So I'm quite happy with that and um, everything seems to be working. So let's see what loop length we get. So I've set my loop to uh, zero here so that we don't actually throttle it and we can just see how fast it really goes. So in mode zero, of course, it's hardly anything, reading the IMU, reading the remote data, all of that data's uh, on the other side here again. But if we now go into mode two and actually make the dog move, you can probably hear it in the background. Let's just pause that data. There are some issues, it's not a FIFO overflow, it's just an issue with my tabs because it goes into single digits. Um, but yeah, we've got between 10 and 15 milliseconds, so we haven't quite got to 10. I did actually try some dummy writes, so changing the stuff in here, so instead of half a megabit as a megabit, even though I can't really communicate with the O drives that fast, it would appear, and I'm not sure why, and then I only got down to 12. So um, I'm pretty happy with my sort of 15 and everything seems to work and I've settled on in the end we're going to run the loop at 20 and we're going to read the IMU at 25 and that appears to uh, not cause any issues with FIFO overflows. So here's my stable 20 milliseconds in mode 2 and you can hear the dog moving in the background and we don't get any FIFO overflows because I'm reading that every 25 milliseconds so uh, basically it should never catch up the loop so that seems pretty good. 
So it would be pretty good if we had a faster interface on the O drive. There are CAN bus pins marked, but that's not implemented in the firmware yet, so it's maybe something for the future. But for now, we're pretty much stuck with UART serial, and I think half a megabit is probably going to be more reliable than a megabit anyway for the three milliseconds of savings we might get if I could actually make it work. And it probably involves screening all the cables and doing a bunch of other stuff to make it reliable. So I'm pretty happy with what we've got, running a 50 hertz cycle for the dog and running the IMU at 40 hertz. So just slightly slower so that the loop never catches up basically. Now what we could do of course is read that IMU in the interrupt service routine so it always interrupts the loop whenever there's data in the FIFO and it never overflows then we might be able to push it up to 50 hertz to match the main loop. At the moment if I run them both at 50 I think the clock in the internal clock at least in the MPU 6050 isn't quite calibrated the same as a Team C so sometimes I still get FIFO overflow so I'm always going to at the moment run the IMU slightly slower than the main loop so it doesn't overflow. But we'll see how that goes, and I'm pretty sure that's gonna do us all right for now. I know we can make a balancing robot at least, which will run slower than that and balance on two wheels. So hopefully that data is gonna be all right for walking on four legs. So what can we do now? We've got a really tight loop, or at least one we know what the time is, and we've got the data from the inertial measurement unit. And I wasn't gonna try and make it dynamically stable straight away. I really wanted to lock that loop down and get all the hardware in the electronics that I needed. But I thought I'd have a little go at trying to make it take diagonal steps and try and use that inertial measurement unit to stay stable. So it's really crude at the moment. All it's doing is doing a translation. So forward and backwards, left or right, basically depending on whether it's tipping, forward or backwards, left and right, to try and keep its center of gravity in the middle so it doesn't tip over on the diagonal legs. And arguably it can only really fall in a diagonal uh, pitch and roll or whatever that axis is, a combination of pitch and roll. Um, and so it's using the two inertial measurement units, two PID controllers, and trying to translate sideways and backwards and forwards over a very short space of time. So, so far so good. Um, looks like it's pretty consistent and you can kind of see it jiggling a little bit there to try and stabilize in one of the axis or the other. Just thought I'd move the stand out of the way so we can see it. Quite confident it's not gonna fall over at this stage. So here we go again, and a couple of different camera angles. I was filming with two cameras, so I'm just cutting between them so you can see the legs are leaving the ground. And it looks like it's doing it quite consistently. For a while anyway, and then it totally loses the plot and wobbles all over the place. And of course what happened in the end was it couldn't keep doing that forever because if it tilts too far and it moves its legs too far then basically that's going to cause it to fall over even more because its legs are off center and its body's off center. So what we really need is some logic to actually go and correct that and take steps so that it keeps its body on center. And at the moment it's not taking steps, it's literally just moving all the legs backwards and forwards or left and right in straight lines using that interpolation and the translation moves. And so of course that's not sustainable. At some point it's gonna overbalance and it's gonna make that issue worse in one direction or the other because all the mass is offset and nothing's symmetrical anymore. But I haven't got around to taking steps just yet. It's just a simple timer that picks up alternate legs on fixed timers and tries to do the translation to correct. So next time we're actually gonna try and sort out taking steps to try and keep it on center as if you were actually walking on a pair of stilts or something and you constantly have to adjust to try and keep your center of mass over the middle. And it'd probably also be easier if it's actually walking forwards or moving in one direction at a fairly constant rate because we know it's always gonna fall in that direction and we can adjust the velocity using the interpolation in the axis that moves the legs back to make sure that actually it picks itself up a bit like leaning on a Segway or walking essentially and constantly catching yourself. So that might be easier than actually trying to do it on the spot. So don't forget to subscribe for more updates on this project and all the other projects. And please have a look at patreon.com slash xrobots or YouTube channel membership and my merchandise store if you want to support me. All right, that's all for now.